Thank you, choir. Over the past 21 days as a church, we have participated in what we have titled 21 Days of Hope. And throughout this period of time, many of us have had our minds and hearts drawn to the hope that we have in God. And I want to direct our attention this morning to that hope in the pages of Scripture. Would you take a Bible and turn with me, if you have one, please, to 1 Peter chapter number 1 this morning. 1 Peter chapter number 1. We're going to look together at verses 3, 4, and 5 today here in the first chapter of Peter's first epistle. The words will be on the screen so you can read along with us. Would you stand, please, for the reading of God's Word? We're in 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in verse number 3. Peter, in the inspiration of God's Spirit, wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And I want to draw our attention particularly to the phrase that's found in verse number three, a lively hope. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for that lively hope we have in and through your son, Jesus Christ. We're thankful that that hope was secured for us, not just through the death and burial of your son, but through his resurrection from the dead. And Lord, today we pray that in these next few moments, you will take your word and you will help every one of us to have understanding I pray there will not be a person in this auditorium or with us online this morning that doesn't understand that lively hope that was secured by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We ask it in his name and for his sake we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Today we celebrate the greatest event in all of human history. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The Apostle Peter says because of that resurrection that every one of us today can have a lively hope. That word lively is a power-packed word, literally speaking. It not only speaks of a living hope or a hope that is alive, but it also speaks of an energizing hope. It is a hope that is not something passive in our lives today, but it is a hope that is very much active. Now, now the word hope there, don't uh, misconstrue that word. We use that word most of the time in our conversations with some skepticism in mind with some element of uncertainty. Like, I may say, I hope Alabama beats UConn. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I didn't finish my sentence in football. Ah! <laughs> yeah, we... Uh, we all laugh because we don't think that Alabama will come anywhere near beating UConn next week in the final four. But, but that's not the way the word hope is used in the scriptures. The, the word hope is used in the scriptures as a confident or sure expectation based upon the reality of an absolute promise. The Lord Jesus this morning is the hope of every Christian. 
The Lord Jesus today secured hope for us through his death, through his burial, and through rising again the third day. He kept that promise. He spoke that promise to his disciples, though they really didn't understand it, and they honestly didn't believe it until it had happened. But he told them that he would be betrayed, he would be crucified, he would be buried, but he always said, and on the third day, rise again. First Peter chapter number one here, if you'll look down to verse 21, you'll find Peter connecting our hope with our faith. It says in verse 21 of chapter one, who by him, that's Jesus, do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. The reason Jesus died, the reason Jesus was buried, the reason Jesus rose again was so that you and I could place our faith in that payment for sin and have applied to our record the righteousness of God's Son. We all come into this world sinners. We are sinners by nature. We are sinners by choice. And because of our sinfulness, we have no relationship with God. But God made man to have relationship and fellowship with him. Man broke that through his own sinful choice by disobeying the only prohibition God gave Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And since that day, man comes into this world a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus is that Savior. He is the one who is our hope. Now, it's quite interesting that the human penman that recorded these words is a man who probably, out of all of the followers of Jesus during his earthly ministry, understood that word hope. Some of us are familiar with the Apostle Peter. We, we, we know that his brother Andrew introduced him to Jesus and he believed on him and followed him. We know that he forsook his fishing business to be a follower of Christ, a disciple of the Lord. We, we know that he is the first one of all the disciples who declared, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But we also know that he's the very one who denied knowing Jesus. No doubt, when he's pinning these words that we've already read this morning, he thought about that night when he warmed himself by the fire in the courtyard of the high priest. But the good news of the gospel is God never gives up on us. As a matter of fact, on the day Jesus resurrected from the dead, Mark chapter 16 and verse 8 records for us that the angel said to the lady, Go tell the disciples and Peter that he go before them into Galilee where he promised he would meet them. Why, why, did, why, did, why did the angel include Peter's name? Why was there a personal reference to Peter? Because Peter, no doubt, at that moment thought the last person Jesus wanted to see was him. You may feel like that this morning. You may feel like the last person God has any interest in is me. Can I just tell you, you're wrong. God loves you. You say, you say, Pastor Raven, I hadn't been to church since last Easter. Or the honest truth, I hadn't been since 20 Easter's ago. Doesn't matter. God knows you. God loves you. God wants you. That, that, that's the message of the resurrected Jesus. Go, go tell my disciples and Peter. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 5 records for us that Peter had a personal meeting with Jesus post-resurrection. So, so if anyone understood the reality of our lovely hope, Peter did. He had had his hope rekindled in spite of his failures. He, he had been able to lead the disciples in a 10-day prayer meeting in an upper room. He had spoken on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. He had taken the gospel to the Gentile centurion Cornelius in his home and saw his entire family come to saving faith in Jesus. Peter understood our lively hope. And he understood that it's not just a hope that is alive within us, but it is a hope that energizes us into action. It is a hope that propels us to say to the entire world, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. There is hope this morning for everyone because Jesus is alive. You say, how do you have such lively hope? Three reasons are given in our text. I want you to see them. First of all, because of our personal relationship. Look at what he says there in verse 3. Blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy. Would you read out loud together the next four words with me? You ready? Here we go. Hath begotten us again. When I read those words, I immediately think of what Jesus said. Jesus said to Nicodemus, the one who was referenced in the dramatic presentation of Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and he said to him, Except a man be born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. See, all of us in this room this morning, we have a first birth. My, my first birth was July the 11th, 1959. Don't try to figure out what that means. I know some of you are right now. That's my first birth. But you know what? Just like I had a first birth, I had a second birth. I was born again March the 15th, 1970. That night, I placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And at that moment, I was begotten again. I was redeemed. I was rescued. I was forgiven. I was declared just and righteous in the sight of God. See, I, just like you and like everyone else since Adam and Eve, was, was estranged from God. I had broken God's law. And because of that, I was separated from God. See, God made us a threefold being when he made us. He made us spirit, soul, and body. And body is that part of us that has senses and functions. Our soul is our emotion, our intellect, our will. But our spirit is that part of us that God made to commune with him and to cooperate with him. And when Adam sinned, Man's spirit spiritually died. That's the reason Paul could write in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, and you hath he quickened, means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and in sins. Because when a person is born again, God forgives us of our sins and regenerates us by his own spirit, placing us into his family through the new birth. How do you know it's real? Because he's alive. <laughs> By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And it is that personal relationship this morning that ignites within me the hope. Paul describing us before salvation, that same second chapter of the book of Ephesians in verse number 12 would say later, having no hope and without God in this world. 
This morning, you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. The good news is, though you are without hope right now, you can leave here with eternal hope. How do you know that? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I love that phrase right before, before that phrase hath begotten us again. It says, according to his abundant mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is God withholding from us that which we deserve. You know what I deserve this morning? I deserve death and hell and eternal separation from God. <clears throat> but because of his abundant mercy. Now, now I, I, I believe every word in the Bible is important. If it just said by the mercies of God, I'd rejoice. That's God withholding what I deserve. But it doesn't say by the mercies of God. It says by the abundant mercy of God. It, it reminds me of that verse Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. That abundant mercy. That, that mercy that is overflowing, that mercy that is ever present, that mercy that is always available. How do you know that, Pastor Raven? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's not his resurrection plus my good works. It's not his resurrection plus my religious deeds. It's not resurrection plus my attendance at Easter. It's his resurrection. And simple faith in his resurrection has secured for me a personal relationship with God. It was real to Peter. He was one of the first ones to the tomb. He is an eyewitness. He saw him that night when he appeared in the upper room. He saw him the next Sunday night as he appeared again. He saw him on the shores of Galilee. And a matter of fact, on that day, he jumped out of the boat and ran to the shoreline to meet and eat with Jesus. You say, how can you and I have that same assurance? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. As a matter of fact, Peter, in writing his next epistle, chapter 1 and verse 19, we have a more sure word than our experience. We have his word. How do you have this lively hope? Number one, it's through a personal relationship. Number two, we see our permanent reservation. Look at verse number four with me, please. Matter of fact, would you read verse four out loud together with me? We're going to read it together. You ready? To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Our, our hope secures for us an inheritance reserved in heaven. Now, now most of us are familiar with what an inheritance is. An inheritance is something that is left behind for those who are living by one who has died. But our inheritance this morning is not left by one who only died. Our inheritance is left this morning by one who is ever living. See, as the child of God, this morning I have a permanent reservation in heaven, not because of the works of righteousness which I have done, but because of his mercy and his grace and his love extended to me through Jesus Christ, his son, I know today that heaven is my eternal home. I love the way Paul wrote it to the Romans. Chapter number 8, and verse number 16, he wrote, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. This morning, everything Jesus has is mine.
When God looks down this morning and sees me and you who have trusted his son as our Savior, he sees no difference between us and Jesus because the blood of Jesus and the righteousness of Jesus covers our sins and makes us acceptable in his sight. I love that word reserved. (laughs) That means to be guarded, to be guaranteed, to be preserved, to be kept. Heaven's our forever home. (laughs) Probably some of us in this room may have received some earthly inheritance. And today you don't even know where it's at. It got stolen. We squandered it or spent it. It was mismanaged. But can I just say to all of us this morning that if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have an inheritance reserved for you in heaven. And further fortify the reality of this reservation. Notice how Peter describes it there in verse number number four. He says incorruptible. That means imperishable, immortal. Everything in this world has built into it a seed of corruption. Everything in this world, the moment it begins, it begins to die. Our greatest monuments succumb to corruption and corrosion. But that's not true of our heavenly inheritance. It's incorruptible. It is undefiled. That word says it cannot be sold or stained. It is is not only preserved, it is pure. In that place where we'll spend forever with God, sin is banished. Death is defeated. Decay is no more. Sorrow does not exist. Sadness has no place. It's undefiled. And then he says, it fadeth not away. That assures us it's never going to pass away. It's eternal. It's substantial. It'll never wear out. It'll not disappoint. And it'll never disappear. It requires no repair. It needs no restoration. It is an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away. How do you have this lively hope? How do you know this is a lively hope? Because of our personal relationship, because of our permanent reservation, but number three, because of our present reality. Not only does Peter speak here of our salvation in the future, he speaks of it in the present. Notice it in verse number five. It says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. We don't just have a guaranteed future reality. We we have a present reality. I'm kept. You're kept this morning. If you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are kept this morning by the power of God. That word kept means garrisoned, protected. It's interesting that that word kept in in the original language of the Greek New Testament was written in means is in present tense. It means I'm not just kept today. I wasn't just kept yesterday, but I'll be kept tomorrow and I'll be kept the next day and I'll be kept the next day and I'll be kept the next day and I'll be kept the next day. Why? Because of our lively hope that's been guaranteed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Matter of fact, this morning, you got better security than President Biden has. You got the, he's got the secret service. You and I got the sovereign service. (laughs) It's the power of God. The power of God that keeps us through faith. We're so united with Jesus this morning that God would have to deny himself to deny us. You know Jesus today. 
You have this present reality ready to be revealed, he says, in the last time. We'll come a day when you and I will fully and completely and absolutely understand it. I'm honest with you this morning. I don't know that I fully comprehend all that I have in my lively hope. When God talks about salvation, he talks about it in three tenses. He, he talks about our past is forgiven. Our, our present is empowered. And our future is secured. <laughs> As our past, salvation cancels all of our sin and guilt. Calvary paid the penalty of sin for us. As to our present, the Holy Spirit is living within us believers this morning and gives us the ability to deal with the power of sin. And as to our future, we are going to a land where there will where never be another mention of sin. We will escape the very presence of sin forever. It's ready to be revealed. But I've got a question for you. Are you ready for eternity? That word ready is a probing word. Probably people in this room today heard that word. Probably somebody said, are you ready? We got to go. Are you ready? And some of us, we weren't ready. So we waited a little longer. Or if you did like me, just drove ahead. I didn't do that because she wasn't ready. I did that because that's my habit on the Lord's day. Are you ready? I ask you this morning. Are you ready for eternity? So, Pastor Raymond, how can you be ready for eternity? It can only happen because you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and believe that his payment on the cross was sufficient for your sins. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This morning, if this Bible was the book of life, the Lamb's book of life in heaven, it has every name recorded of every person who's ever believed on the Lord Jesus. Is your name inside of it? That's the only way to be ready. By having your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life through the new birth, through being born again. So really what I'm asking you this is this. Are you born again? Have you had a second birth? I testified a few moments ago that my first birth was July 11, 1959. My second birth was March 15, 1970. Everybody in this room knows your first birth. What I'm asking you this morning is, have you had a second birth date? That's the only way to be ready. You say, Pastor, I don't know that this morning. Then God says, if you'll confess, that word confess means you agree with him. Agree with him about what, Pastor? Agree with him that you're a sinner. Nobody can be saved without admitting that they've sinned. Agreeing with him that you're a sinner. Agreeing with him that his death on the cross was a sufficient payment. Agreeing with him that Jesus Christ was raised again from the dead as a guarantee on that payment. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe, what does that mean? That means trust, rely, rest upon. What are you resting on? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me ask you one more time. Are you ready for eternity? It's all dependent on whether you've been born twice. Born once, die twice. Physical and spiritual separation forever. Born twice, die once. Would you bow your heads with me, please?